Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Let me welcome you to another episode of the podcast for Without Spot or Blemish Ministry. Glad you're here. Today we're going to talk about the Messianic and Hebrew roots movements in the church. But before we do, let's start with a prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. Sorry for our sins. Father God, cleanse us of our sins by the power of the shed blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we also come before you today with a subject that has to do with fractions or factions in the church and uh, that bare examination uh, as we all do and because we want to be without spot or blemish before you Lord for your soon coming return but in the meantime Father God I'm just asking you to speak let your spirit speak let not flesh speak today let your word come forth I come against any demonic interference in this message either through my own words my own tongue or through the ears of the listener I loose that we would be able to hear clearly from the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Thank you for that. Clearly from the Holy Spirit, that he would lead us into all truth as Jesus promised he would. And so we just praise you and thank you for that, Father God. And I just come against all demonic influence on each and every listener and myself um, with regard to anything we believe that is not truth. I come against every lie, bind it up, every seed of the lie that's been planted in any one of us, I bind it up, rebuke it, command it to leave, command it to just die in our hearts and minds. All lies, may they just die and be and blow away like dust in the wind, as it were. I just loose that in Jesus' mighty name, and may God's Holy Spirit be upon us that goes before, before him to burn up the enemy. May the enemy be burned out of all of our lives, especially denominational um, beliefs that are, are not biblical. May that all these practices that are not of you be taken away and, and burned up in the fire, Father God, as it were. And may we, we come out of this uh, more holy, more pure than we were before we began. May we all be made different by this message. I praise you and thank you for that in Jesus' mighty name and in the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen. Okay, so you may have actually listened to my podcast about Sunday Sabbath and Easter as well as one about Christmas. And in many ways, I'm a believer in the Bible and following the Bible and not adding thereto in any way, shape, or form. And God has given us many uh, celebrations, the seven feasts as described in Leviticus, that we can celebrate and, and honor. And I believe that the Christian church should be doing that. We've been, according to Scripture, grafted into Israel. We are as the strangers that attached ourselves to Israel and adopted their God. We are following the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I think it's a flaw in the church for factions of the church to only focus on the New Testament without reading the Old, because the Old Testament speaks to the personality of our God, his likes, his dislikes, and the Word of God itself is Jesus Christ. You know, it says in the book of John, the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ is that Word. He is the Torah. He is the Psalms, he is the prophets, because they all spoke of him as he expounded to the two um, that he met on the road after he was resurrected. Those two that said, didn't our hearts burn within us while he talked with us, by the way. So he expounded to them from the scripture. There was no New Testament at that time. He expounded to them of himself from this book that we now call the Old Testament. And I'm not even sure I like that moniker because... The entire thing's a testament. Of course, we have a new covenant. Um, I guess we could call it the old covenant versus the new covenant. But the new covenant didn't necessarily do away with the old covenant. It did fulfill parts of it, as I've addressed in other podcasts. At any rate, saying I say all that to say that we as a people, I believe, should be honoring the feast. We should be honoring um, the law, as it were, as it was laid out in the Old Testament Torah, particularly the Ten Commandments which uh, none of them, in my view, have been done away with. They were not nailed to the cross with Jesus Christ, hence my Sabbath podcast that we are still to be honoring the Sabbath, as well as the fact, which is on the seventh day, by the way, which is the day the Jews honor it, as well as the fact that Jesus said, speaking in future tense, that pray not that your flight be on the Sabbath, and he was speaking of when we would have to flee during the tribulation period, which is in the end time. So clearly, 
if he said that, why and how did he do away with the Sabbath, which he did not, as listen to the other podcast for more information on that. So I'm saying all these things to, to give you a premise for why a person that believes these things would be drawn to both the Messianic and the Hebrew Roots movements. And I am going to tell you why I could not remain in either one after visiting them for several um, Shabbat, as they would call it, services in their synagogue or their church, if you want to call it that. So let's begin with the Messianic movement. Okay, what's good about the Messianic movement? And what is, at least in the early 90s when I kind of began the journey with it, and I have been to Messianic movements in three major cities. So I would say probably at least 15 visits maybe a little more, maybe a little less. It's somewhere around there. But And I've also gone to home services with the Messianic movement. So what happened? Well, the first thing that happened was the praise and worship was crazy good. This was in the early 90s when all Paul Wilbur up to Zion was big. Then he came out with Shalom Jerusalem. And to this day, I still think they're great albums. And they're so worshipful. And just hearing someone of the... of the Hebrew blood, if you will, and this may be wrong on my part, but it just was exciting. And to I'm not trying to overlift that side of praise and worship up because there's plenty of good praise and worship. It's all good. But I like the exciting nature of the music. I like the violins and the upbeat. And I love that song, Come Let Us Go Up to the Mountain of the Lord. And uh, I mean, it's just so many great songs. And Shalom Jerusalem on that live album that he didn't did, it just... Man, it just it spoke to me, and it that was very early in my walk, and it it really I just would play it in my car and sing it at the top of my voice. And when I first went to one of their services, the very first time I heard that music, I went right into their bookstore and and bought that Up to Zion album. Phenomenal! Oh my gosh, just I can feel the anointing talking about it, and God blessed it. I mean, God, I believe God was in it. I absolutely do. You know, God wanted, wants to anoint His people, whether they are they are Jewish or 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 former Gentiles. Like I don't believe that we as believers are Gentiles anymore. We've been grafted into Israel. We are born again. We are new creatures in Christ. We are not goyim or Gentiles or or or, or practicing heathen. That's changed if we're honoring the Word of God. But at any rate, that was kind of an aside. So man, that was so exciting. But there was one thing, many things that became troubling, and much of it had to do with the religious spirit. And I saw parallels between what was going on in the Messianic Jewish congregation and what went on in Catholicism, believe it or not, and it having to do with the religious spirit and idolatry and just holding on to religious and cultural traditions that were not really Bible. So... The first example of something that just really troubled me as having been a former Catholic was the fact that the Torah in its scrolls is in this velvety encasement with the scroll, you know, in, in a scroll, and it's got the two you know, sticks, as it were, that they roll up on. And in the beginning of the service, and I know this is also Jewish tradition in the non-Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach believing side of Judaism, They, of course, do this tradition as well, where they parade around the Torah and everybody gets all excited, runs up, kisses their hand, touches it. You know, they just uh, go crazy over it. Well, you might be saying, what's wrong with that? That's the Word of God. Why not get excited for the Word of God? Well, primarily because that's an object. That's ink on paper. And God is a spirit. We must worship Him in spirit and in truth. We're not to take anything made with man's hands and uplift it. We're supposed to have a spiritual love relationship with a spiritual being. And yes, God is his word, but words, like I'm speaking right now, words are spoken. They're also spiritual. Yes, there's something physically happening. My vocal cords are vibrating to create a sound from the air passing through them. And then your eardrum is doing its little vibration to actually receive what I'm saying. But it's 
oral communication is a very spiritual thing. Even written communication is a very spiritual thing, but that's still an object. It, to me, it was no different than all the people that go into Vatican Square and have touched and kissed the foot of the statue of Peter so many times that the foot's been worn away. It's the same thing to me. It was very troubling to me. And in fact, in this one synagogue, there was an Israeli associate pastor there who, I mean, I was so close with. I really liked him, and we made friends really quickly. And we even met sort of randomly. I didn't even meet him at the synagogue. Um, I met him somewhere else, and I think nothing's random. I think it was, it was God's will that we meet. But I told him, and I, you know, once I knew in my heart that it was wrong, he became very upset with me, and our, our relationship ended. And uh, it was hurtful to me, but I couldn't lie to him. I was not going to lie and say I thought it was okay when I, I knew in my heart that it wasn't. You know, it's, it's no different than when God had Israel make a staff with a serpent on the end because they were all under this plague. They had sinned against God, and these snakes, these serpents were coming out and biting them and killing them. And Moses made this serpent staff, and if they looked at the staff, they would no longer, uh, they would live or no longer be bitten. I may be telling that story a little off, but I'll, the scripture's up now, so I'll show you the scripture about it. But at any rate, as time went on, they began to actually worship this staff and use it, use this physical thing as an idol, and God had them destroy it. I see this as analogous, that we do not need to be parading around physical objects. We need to keep our worship and our love on God himself, not on even a piece of paper rolled up in two wooden sticks with some velvet around it. I mean, it's just, it's, it's idolatry. That may offend some of you, like I offended that associate pastor. I pray it doesn't. I pray you understand uh, the gist of where I'm coming from. So then there are some other traditions that are extra biblical. I think if you look back at Jesus when he was on the earth, there was a couple things that he was really against, and he was against traditions that men had made up that were not God's word. Jesus knew that it was enough that we honor what had been written in the scriptures and not continue to honor these traditions that are not in the scriptures. You know, the Jews might say that the Talmud, which is almost like their catechism, you know how the Catholics have a catechism, it's another book of laws and canon. Well, the Jews have what's called their Talmud, and they say it's basically a fence around the Torah to help to keep you within the realm of operating in a, in, a, in a state of obedience toward the Torah. But I believe that Jesus would teach, and he did teach, and if he were here right now speaking to you, he would say so much of that extra-biblical um, stuff was burdens too heavy to be borne, and that's what he chastised the Pharisees and the Sadduce Sadducees about, these extra-biblical traditions that he said they wouldn't lift with one of their own fingers, the lawyers and whatnot. You, wouldn't, you won't even lift this with one of your own, the own fingers, and you, and you put this, gr these grievous burdens on people, when it's enough just to obey what God's given us. It, I mean, it's enough to obey God's Word and not any, any extra-biblical teachings. So I felt like that was part of it, and and I felt like in the Messianic movement, there was such a concern with not offending Judaism or, or, or Hebrew people or Jews themselves that they took on their extra-biblical traditions, such as parading the Torah around, or wearing kippahs, you know, the skull cap. They, they did a lot of these things in order to appear like they were Jewish, and I'm saying we don't need to do outward shoes to prove that we are, we are Israel, that we are God's people. What we need to do is obey his word. And by that obedience to his high holy standard, his moral law, his, his code that he left for us, and that now, according to Jeremiah, he's written in our hearts and our minds, that's the new covenant. He's written his word into us. And by obeying it, that's how we show that we love him. Jesus said, if you love me, obey me. It's that obedience. It's not obedience to man's traditions. And that's been a big, big part of this ministry. And the purpose of this ministry is for us to become without spot or blemish. And when we honor man's traditions, such as Christmas, as I pointed out in the other blog, I mean, podcast, or Easter, these are men's traditions that are not in the Bible. And that's, 
I believe, to get to the point where we're without spot or blemish, the bride that Jesus is coming back for, we have to let go of all these traditions. And the Messianic Jews and the Hebrew roots have let go of those unbiblical traditions that come from paganism. They don't celebrate Easter for the most part or Christmas, and they honor the feast, which I think is what we're supposed to do, and that's why I was drawn to them. But it's even... The Jews, obviously, because Jesus chastised them for this, they have their own set of extra biblical traditions that the he, the Messianics are honoring. And for me, I just want to have a pure biblical relationship with, with Yeshua HaMashiach, with Jesus Christ. And I don't want to be sidetracked by all of these man-made things such as the Torah parading, which I believe, again, is idolatry, and it really offended my spirit. And, of course, the kippah wearing. And and, uh, also, I've seen Messianic pastors call themselves rabbi, which is another parallel to Catholicism, because Jesus said, call no man father, rabbi, or master, for one is your father who is in heaven. And Jesus is our, our rabbi, our master. He is the shepherd of the sheep. And, of course, there are pastors, but... To call themselves rabbi when Jesus said not to do it, that's another extra, actually anti-Christ, anti-Yeshua activity that we should not partake in. And it's wrong. It's really wrong. And actually, you know, before I said I'd been in three major cities, I've actually been to Messianic churches in four major cities. So I forgot about one. So that's the story there. Also, I I noticed in in the Messianic world, they had, there was one that was spirit-filled, that is, they believed in the gifts, tongue-talking and praying, healing, and casting demons out and all that. And then in others I've been to, they were more like Bible church, like leave the gifts alone, it was for the early dispensation. So even within the realm of the Messianic world, they've got their own factions and their own approaches, just like outside of it. At least that's what I noticed. Obviously, this ministry believes in full gospel, casting out demons, speaking in tongues. I have a video on uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and all the other gifts of the Spirit. So so obviously, I, I couldn't be in a Messianic version of church where they're not believing in that or practicing it. And I will say the one that I went to that was spirit-filled when the pastor, he may have called himself rabbi too, all I know is at the beginning of the service, he prayed a prayer to cast the demons out of that room and man, it lightened up big time. You could feel it. So that was that that was telling for me. That was really amazing. I want to talk about one more thing that I've seen in the Messianic church, if you will, is the use of the so-called Star of David. Now, there's lots of research that's been done on this symbol that it does not, or that it did not exist in the time of David, that it's relatively a new symbol. And you can see from the images I'm putting up on the screen that it very closely resembles um, the as above, so below symbolism of the Masonic uh, square and compass And I just don't believe that this symbol that's on the Israeli flag represents God. And I think that there's a large portion of the Hebrew people that are living deceived, just as there's a large portion of the rest of the world that are living deceived about who's in control of the governments of our of our world. And I'm not saying that I think Bibi Netanyahu is antichrist or if he doesn't believe in christ he's obviously antichrist in that sense but i'm not saying that i believe he's part of the one world cabal or anything like that perhaps he is perhaps he's just another player on the stage but and i don't know why i went off on him because when he speaks when he came to the u.s and spoke to our congress last year i thought man i wish he was our president i mean there's a lot of things i really respect about bb benjamin netanyahu and Um, If he's real and he's not just another pawn in the Illuminati system, then that's great. But I just don't believe that the Star of David was a Star of David, and I do believe that that symbol does not... I mean, it was used on patches uh, by the Nazis in World War II, evidently, and, you know, to identify the Jewish people. 
And I just think it's a demonic symbol, just as the cross is. So if you want to learn more about how I feel about symbols, like the, like the cross and the spires and the fish uh, symbols that people put on their cars, you can watch this podcast. Just click above. But at any rate, that's something that the Messianic uh, Jewish temples that I've seen, or synagogues, if you want to call them that, have on the sides of them, just like a Baptist church would have a cross, and both are wrong. Let's move on to the Hebrew Roots movement. This is all anecdotal, I want you to know. I have not, I didn't spend a whole bunch of time in Hebrew Roots. I see a a division between them and Messianics. Maybe that division isn't there. I just saw it that way. So if I'm misinterpreting or misdefining things, feel free to comment and and help me understand it better. But I, I went to only one Hebrew Roots service, and of course they honored Sabbath, Shabbat as the Hebrew word is for Sabbath. They honored that. Uh, they honored the feast, the feast uh, Sabbaths, and had celebrations for them, which were great. But where I thought they went wrong, and to a greater degree than the Messianic services I went to, was this focus on language and on speaking as many words in Hebrew as they possibly could, including every single name in the Bible, every single word that they could use for Holy Spirit, for God, Elohim, they used a lot, also Yeshua. But before I continue, I wanted to address the idea that speaking Hebrew is really not an issue. If you want to learn Hebrew, you should do it. And even going to services where they use Hebrew, that's not wrong. What is wrong, in my view, which I plan to prove out in this podcast, is to require and indeed make it seem wrong for other people to use their native language. That's where a superiority, a pride, comes into play that is not from God, in my view. So I just want to make that clear before I begin this analysis of what's wrong with the Hebrew movement from a language perspective. It's not wrong that they want to speak Hebrew. I'm not saying that. What's wrong is trying to force others to do so, and I will show you how that happened at this particular Hebrew Roots congregation. Getting back to the use of the word Yeshua for Jesus. In this one congregation I went to, they said Yeshua wasn't really his name, that the original name for both Jesus, Jesus is obviously a derivative of the Greek, that word, they believed that Joshua and Jesus really are the same name, but the name in Hebrew would be Jeusha. Let me spell that because I may be mispronouncing it, but J-E-U-S-H-A. That's what they believed. And they believed if you used another name, you were in error, but God would honor it until you found out the truth, at which point you would be required to use the proper name. And some of them believed Yeshua was okay. Others said it wasn't, and that you need to say Jeusha. So having said all that, this is where everything went off the rails for me at this service. I don't believe it was a born, it was a spirit-filled place either, so it felt somewhat dead to me in that sense. But where it went really off the rails was with this language thing. And it also, the, they were very intellectual in their approach. I'm not against study. I'm not, I mean, believe me, we need to read our Bibles and study to show ourselves approved. But the intellectualism was, I believe, overtaking the truth and being spiritual and knowing God on a personal level. You know, you need, you need both. And I felt like the intellectual aspect of it was to the, at the cost of the spiritual connection to God. Because a lot of times intellectualism leads to pride, and I'll kind of try to explain how it did so in this case. So, and I'm going to sort of tell you a story. After the service, they would have food, which was great. Although the person that was manning the food, I thought was working a little too hard on the Sabbath. But at any rate, the one that was serving us, or at least walking up, we walk up there and, and, and get the food, and they were all in crock pots, so they were probably cooking beforehand, but... She still seemed hard at work to me. But at any rate, um, we walked up and get the food, go sit down. The pastor comes over and he sits, sits by me. And he says, 
you know, the name Jesus doesn't have any power, right? And I'm sitting there thinking, is this guy, has he lost it? And I I look at him with this befuddled look, and I know he's like, he's like, he, he, he sees that he's clearly uh, befuddled me. And he says, because that's not really his name, that's a transliteration over many languages. And once you know that, you need to use his original name in order for it to have power. He knew I had been writing songs, and in those songs, uh, I didn't tell him, but he was right. I'd used the name Jesus, of course, many times. And he was concerned about that. He wanted to make sure that I was using Jesus' real name. And so we began to talk, and as he talked about it, I, he showed me a Bible, and a pre-1600s King James, like the original before the Revised, and he was telling, he showed me Jesus' name in there, and it was actually spelled, the J was an I. And so there was a time in the development of the English language where the letter J in written form didn't exist. And so he showed me that as a proof that the name Jesus has come through so many iterations as it's crossed over many languages, according to him. So basically what he's saying is that Jesus had his Hebrew name, which was either Jehusha or I suppose Yeshua, if you believe that. And then the next name he got was going to be Greek, which I believe sounds like Iesus. And I'll put up before you what it actually looks like and the phonetic spelling of it. And then, of course, his belief was that it went through the Catholic Church through Latin, because you know the Catholic Bibles are mostly translated from the Latin Vulgate. Then he believes it came to English from there, so here we are, we're at Hebrew, Greek, Latin, fourth version, original English, fifth version, the English we have today. So he says that's not his name. Using it is powerless. He honors it until you know, and then you've got to change. And I'm sitting there thinking, wow, this doesn't seem right. And I'm not trying to lift myself up because I've been very interested in languages you know, for a long time. I actually taught English as a second language for three years, I taught, I applied for a linguistics master's, and I'm here, I am talking about intellectual things. It's, you know, it's, to me now, it's completely unnecessary. I've just, I just like languages, and I recognize the beauty in all these languages God created at Babel. I mean, he went from one language to there are over, I believe, 6,000 languages, recorded languages today. I think it's over 6,900 recorded languages today, and it's just an amazing thing to hear different people talk to each other in their own language. It's just, it's fascinating to me. And I was sitting there thinking, okay, the name is just pronounced differently now. Doesn't make it evil. Because I was thinking about my own name. My name is Douglas. That's my full name, obviously. You can call me Doug. But my name is Douglas. And in the, the Hispanic world, it's Douglas. In the Greek world, it's Douglas. And I always loved hearing people call me Douglas. It just was so different and fun, and it made me, it made me feel good. It was just a, it was just different. I liked it. I liked the the different sound of my name in another language, another culture. I really enjoyed it. And so I was sitting there thinking, well, why would Jesus be offended if I like my name being said with different pronunciations? Why wouldn't he? I mean, he created all the languages, and he did it on purpose. And so one of the other members of his congregation spoke up and said, well, don't you know that Jesus is a derivative of Hail Zeus? And he, he was saying that the J part is Hail in Greek, and then the Zeus, the Zeus part is Zeus in Greek. And we're really hailing the false god Zeus, really, who represents Satan, as we well know. So here we have the possibility that we're saying the name Jesus and in fact, we're saying, Hail Zeus. The pastor immediately interjected. He said, no, that's, that's wrong. That's not true. That's not really what, what's happened there. And of course, I went and followed up and did a, did a study of it, that hail in Greek is actually Cairo, means hail. And then, of course, Zeus is, the Z is very strongly pronounced, while the in the word Jesus, it's not an us instead of us. So to me, that was a little, little bit off because, of course, in Greek, his name was Iesus. 
So, and of course, now in Spanish, it's pronounced, they pronounce it almost like Jesus. And if you look at other names um, across languages, like Robert in English is Roberto in Spanish, Patrick is Patricio, George is Jorge, which is quite different from George. James can be Jaime, John can be Juan, you, you know, and so there's just so many, so many differences there between that J and the H sound and Jesus and Juan and, and Jaime. So why is all there, why is there this fuss, you know? So again, I looked it up. There, the word for hail is certainly not uh, j in Greek. It's kairo. And then, of course, I, we talked already about Zeus, and it's sounding different from sus. So, and here I'll show you the Greek. The Greek word is iesus for Jesus. So for me, we really are going straight from the Hebrew to the Greek, to Jesus. And the Greeks say it one way, the Hebrews say it another way, we say it this way. I see no reason to not call Jesus Jesus because God is the one that broke up the languages. God is the one that gave us our own cultures based on language at Babel when he was trying to stop them from building their tower to the heavens. And that was on purpose. And the differences in our cultures are quite beautiful, really. The thing that we need to extract from Judaism, if you will, or from the Hebrew basis of our, of our belief system is the morality of it, the love, loving God through obedience to his word, adopting traditions and even languages that are from Hebrews or from the Jewish people is not required. We don't have to speak their language. God has been able to have his word translated properly, at least through the King James Version. I know about all the version uh, conspiracies. I actually believe that they're true. I mean, I can't read an NIV Bible. It's just, it's missing the word blood, you know, dozens of times in the New Testament, and they basically altered the gospel, and it's just, it's just a horrible translation. And I think they've done it on purpose, obviously, to try to water down the word. But I do think that the King James is as close as we can get. And it's, it's, if, we, if we read that, we can know God. But at any rate, for us, to, for us to all have to learn Hebrew as a second or even third language, I don't think God requires that. I mean, because he's the one that purposely split up the languages. And for some people it's very difficult to actually speak a second or third language. And they feel much more at home in their own language. And when they begin to speak to God in a foreign language, it makes God feel foreign. And this is my point. If you don't feel comfortable in the Hebrew language, which you rightly shouldn't because God purposely separated the languages himself, you're going to feel that God is foreign and far from you. And that's what Satan wants. That's what Satan has done through Catholicism, where he told he gets uh, the church to say that only the only the priests can really understand the Bible, and only they should read it and uh, translate it for you. And has them in the past they used to say their services in Latin. That was all to make God farther away and make it harder to know Him. God doesn't want that. He wants to know you personally. He created the language you speak. And he wants to communicate with you in that sense. So what happens in Hebrew roots and the Messianic movement where it draws people that are drawn to the Hebrew culture, which is a fun culture. I mean, it's amazing. I would love to go to Israel and hang out and see what it's like. I love the Jewish people. They're awesome. I mean, it's just in many ways they're awesome. I don't want to lift them up. They have their own foibles just like everybody else. I don't want to over deify them in any sense, but I like that culture. I really do. But I'm just saying that we, people that are not multilingual, don't need to adopt it to be better Christians. It's just not required by God in the least. And it's a point of pride for those that are drawn to it that are able to span the bridge between languages and they get deified and lifted up and it becomes a point of pride because they can easily speak and understand this foreign language. And it's wrong. It really is wrong, and it's, it's, it repulses people 
that come into the church and want to get close to God, and all of a sudden, they don't even know where to turn in their Bible because they don't know, you know, the Hebrew words for all the names. They're like, he's, maybe they're going to say, turn to Isaiah, and they say the Hebrew name, and you don't even know where to go. And it's just, it's really foolishness, to be honest. It's demonic, if you ask me. It really is bad. But the worst thing, coming back around again to the beginning of this, this conversation with the pastor, where he said the name Jesus has no power, that was a lie from the pit. That was demonic and wrong. And I pray that pastor will repent one day because that is just dead on wrong. The name doesn't mean hail, hail Zeus, and it's our word for, our, for the Son of God, and we can use it. And I wrote a blog about it, which you can delve deeper into this, but at the end, I wrote this in bold. I said, therefore, those who say there is no power in the English name of Jesus risk hurting the faith of those who do, who are in submission to God's will that the languages of the people, peoples of the earth be divided. And they, if they do not feel comfortable saying the Messiah's name in a language which is foreign to them, that's understandable. And being pressured and ultimately forced to do so can make the worshiper feel as if God is distant and foreign and decries the fact that there are other languages and cultures outside of the Hebrew, when it was God who created those differences through confounding of the original language of Babel. The gap that needs to be bridged between the cultures, as I pointed out, is the one that has to do with the stopping of sin through the adoption of obedience to God's commandments, not in the adoption of the Hebrew language, tradition, and, and culture, which are separate, separate from how we are supposed to live according to the biblical mandates. Therefore, the Yeshua or Jeyusha only name movement is an error, and God is not happy with this, especially in as much as it, it can discourage intimacy between himself and his people within the confines of their own languages. And one final thing to remember about the Yeshua or Jeyusha only movement is that it's actually a point of pride, as I said, and superiority exhibited by Hebrew roots and Messianic believers. It's like saying the Jewish Hebrew language and culture, and as a consequence, the Jewish he Hebrew people's way of speaking, behavior, behaving culturally are superior to others. This is far from the truth, as what makes anyone a superior person is keeping of God's commandments, not the absorption of an earthly human language or culture. Yes, God honored the descendants of Abraham by giving him them his word, but his word is what we are supposed to adopt, follow and keep, not necessarily a language, tradi extra-biblical traditions, or cultural underpinnings that are outside of the, sim of the simple obedience to God's commands, i.e., there is no command stating, thou must speak Hebrew to know me. So that is the final reason I will state here that I couldn't stay. I just saw these things that we're talking about, the what I perceive to be idolatry, the honoring of traditions that the Bible doesn't require, the honoring and lifting up of a language that God doesn't require that we do. Now, I'm not against calling Jesus Yeshua HaMashiach or even Jehusha, if that's his, that's his name. I'm just saying that we should not exclude the English name for those that are in English and even give them the impression that it's wrong and that it will have no power. That in and of itself is wrong. So, and one final caveat, I do not in any way want to discourage you, the people that love the Hebrew and want to learn it. Go for it. I mean, I think it's amazing to learn another language if you, if you can do it and God blesses you to do it. But it just cannot be at the expense of looking down your nose at people that can't because everybody has different gifts. And the bridging of the gap between two languages, that's a gift. If you can do that, that's a gift. And not everybody has that gift. It's, it's a special gift for those that can do it and do it well. So let's go ahead and conclude with prayer. Father God, we praise you and thank you for this opportunity to speak on these uh, subjects. We just want to be a people that follow you and obey your word, that live lives that are without spot or blemish, so that we can be working toward getting this filthy, filthy wedding dress that's on the church right now. It's so dirty and, and tattered and torn and ripped. And it's nowhere near white right now. It is, we are off in so much idolatry and sin and witchcraft. And a Jezebel spirit controls the church on so many levels. Father God, we want to come out and be holy and separate before you. We want to be part of the bride of Christ that is without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing. So I just praise you and thank you for just leading us to that. And, and whatever part of the Hebrew roots or, or messianic movement is righteous father god such as honoring the sabbath on the right day such as not honoring honoring pagan holidays such as 
um, honoring the feast days. May we just embrace all of that, but may we see through the things that are not of you, through the unbiblical, you know, extra biblical traditions of man. May we see through that and not adopt those things and walk in your way. And I just bind up every demonic spirit that has a hold, a religious spirit that has a hold of anybody listening or anybody they want to pray for. I pray uh, to, to get this religious spirit off of them. I bind it up in, in agreement with those that are listening if they want to pray this prayer. I bind that up and command it to leave all the listeners and the people they're praying for as well as myself in Jesus' mighty name. And I loose the love of God in us, a love affair with God, a knowing Him on a spiritual level and, and, and not on a physical level, not on objects made with man's hands. I pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. The saints said amen. Thanks again for listening and stopping in. Be sure to subscribe and like if you liked it. Hey, thumbs down if you didn't. But uh, thanks for coming in and listening. And um, if it's Sabbath when you're listening, Shabbat Shalom. Amen. His name is Jesus, Savior of the world, an olive branch extended for our sins, an olive branch to say that you're forgiven, accept the gift of His love.